There have been a lot of debates about coronavirus vaccinations in Australia. The number of people who have received vaccination has been increasing continuously. Our state government has declared a target vaccination rate of 70%. Reaching that target is a condition for the easing of lockdown restrictions. Now there are discussions about how the roadmap coming out of lockdown might look like. How could we as a society live with coronavirus when not everyone is vaccinated against it? This is very complex. There are discussions of what would happen if the government introduces vaccine passport or certificate as proof of vaccination that people must show in order to gain entry to venues, including churches. Would we really deny entry to church to anyone who is not fully vaccinated? I believe Jesus' teaching in the Gospel according to Matthew chapter 15 is relevant in the discussions about vaccine and reopening of churches. Often these discussions revolve around the science, the medical advice and public health advice, not to mention the politics and the impact on the economy and the society. What Jesus has to teach us in this passage goes beyond all that and exposes the real problem, which is the problem with our heart. This is the third video on Matthew 15. Remember, it began with Jesus' opponents, the religious leaders of his day. They attacked him by using their tradition of washing hands before they eat. Jesus calls them blind guides. The first video was titled, When Jesus Confronts the Tradition of Blind Guides. In the second video, I explored the question of how do we recognize blind guides and their tradition in our lives, and what do we do about them? If you haven't watched the first two videos, please watch that first before you continue watching this one. In this video, I would like to apply what Jesus says to the discussions about vaccines and reopening churches. Let's read again what Jesus says, particularly from verse 10 onwards. Jesus called the crowd to him and said, Listen and understand. What goes into someone's mouth does not defile them, but what comes out of their mouth, that is what defiles them. In the Old Covenant system, to be defiled or to be unclean was like being God's enemy or being in debt to Him and society. If you were defiled or unclean, you could not have fellowship with the Holy God and members of God's people. Jesus is saying here that the problem is not with the things entering the mouth, but the things coming out of it. Now, I'm a visual learner, so I've created a table with two columns. The left column is what enters the mouth and does not defile a person. The right column is what comes out of the mouth and defiles a person or makes them unclean. So what does Jesus mean by that? He explains what he means a few sentences later in verse 17. Don't you see that whatever enters the mouth goes into the stomach and then out of the body? So let me add this to our table. And then Jesus says, But the things that come out of a person's mouth come from the heart, and these defile them. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, slander. These are what defile a person, but eating with unwashed hands does not defile them. Now, If I add these examples to our table, it would look like this. Jesus says what defile a person are not the things on the left column, but the things on the right column. Actually, he's quoting from the Ten Commandments here, namely number six, you shall not murder, seven, you shall not commit adultery, eight, you shall not steal, nine, you shall not give false testimony, and maybe ten, you shall not covet others. Here Jesus takes God's law and uses it as a spotlight on the human heart. He's saying our real problem is the problem with our heart our inner character. Our heart is corrupt and opposed to God. That's what makes it impossible for us to have a fellowship with the Holy God. No matter what kind of food you eat, whether it's kosher or halal, no food in and of itself could change the internal character of our heart. Now, how is this relevant in the discussion about vaccines and reopening churches? Jesus doesn't talk about vaccines here, does he? No, he doesn't. But could it be applied to vaccines? I believe it could. After all, 
Jesus applies the principle to the Jewish tradition of hand washing. He says in verse 20, Eating with unwashed hands does not defile a person. In our table here, it's listed on the left column. So hand washing could be seen from various perspectives. From the perspective of Jesus' opponents, eating with unwashed hands breaks their tradition. From a scientific or medical perspective, eating with unwashed hands would likely expose a person to germs, virus, and so on. But from God's perspective, it doesn't defile a person. That means it does not disqualify that person from seeking fellowship with God and members of God's people. Vaccination could be seen from various perspectives too. From a scientific or medical perspective, vaccinated people are less likely to contract coronavirus, less likely to require hospitalization if they do contract it, and less likely to die from it than unvaccinated people. The vast majority over 85% of those who were hospitalized in our state last month were unvaccinated. But from God's perspective, vaccination doesn't defile a person. That means it does not disqualify that person from seeking fellowship with God and members of God's people. There are people who are hesitant to receive vaccination because they believe it's a sin. But the Bible makes no clear-cut, straight-line argument from any specific text that vaccination or vaccine passports are wrong. There are people that are part of a religious tradition that refuses all medical treatment, along with any other shots or vaccines. But that is a human tradition, not God's word. And there are very few such groups. There are also Christians who are concerned that accepting a COVID vaccine represents endorsement of abortion or being complicit in it. Now, Dr. Megan Best, a Christian bioethicist who wrote the book Fearfully and Wonderfully Made, has argued compellingly that is not true. I recommend that you read her careful explanation, which was endorsed by Glenn Davis, the Anglican Archbishop of Sydney, when it was first published in September last year. I will provide a link to her article as well as some other art helpful articles in the description box under the video. Those who believe vaccination is sinful sometimes quote Paul's words in his first letter to the Corinthian church, chapter 3, where he says that their body is God's temple, and he warns that, that anyone who destroys God's temple will be judged by God. But they're taking Paul's words out of context. Paul is talking about the church as God's temple, and his warning was for those who cause division in the church. It's not a sin to get vaccinated or have a vaccine passport. It's not a sin to not get those things either. Vaccination is one of those disputable matters on which Christians are free to disagree with each other based on their conscience. See Romans 14. This is why we should be deeply concerned by the implications of restricting church to the fully vaccinated. This is also the stance of the current Anglican Archbishop of Sydney, Kanishka Raphael. He said negotiations with the government were ongoing, but he and other church leaders have concerns about the idea of vaccine passports. He said, I quote, Jesus is Lord of all, and his gospel is a gospel for all. A no entry sign at the door of the church is wholly inconsistent with the gospel preached inside. He said, Christian community must not be divided by race, gender, ethnicity, age, nor economic or educational status, or vaccination status. None of those things should become barriers to the fellowship we share because of Jesus. At the same time, Archbishop Raphael said, churches must also ensure that they are safe for all who attend. He said, I quote, I'm aware that some people have ethical and other concerns about vaccines, and they are entitled to decline vaccinations while those concerns are not addressed to their satisfaction. But he also encourages those who still hesitate to receive vaccines to consider the risk of remaining unvaccinated, including the risk of contracting the disease and requiring hospitalization oneself, or infecting a loved one or someone who is vulnerable because they are under 12 years old 
or have not had the opportunity to be vaccinated or are medically unable to be vaccinated or are indigenous or immunocompromised. Please note how the Archbishop is careful to stress both our desire for public safety through vaccination and our responsibility to minister to all people regardless of vaccination status. It is inevitable that we will experience tension between these two entirely valid but competing desires. On one hand, we desire to keep ourselves, our families, and our community protected from coronavirus. That's a right expression of love in obedience to God. But on the other hand, we also desire to meet and work together for worship and mission. That is another right expression of love in obedience to God. Navigating the demands of these two desires will take great care. There will be a series of meetings soon for ministers and church wardens to discuss plans for reopening of churches once the government's roadmap is in effect. Now, before I go on, can I please remind you that if you find this video helpful, please click on the like and subscribe button and share it with other people so that they can also benefit from it. But Jesus doesn't stop there. He doesn't just tell us what does not defile a person. He also tells us what does defile a person. It's the things on the right column of this table here. Evil thoughts and actions, including murder, false testimony, and slander. Remember what Jesus said about murder in the Sermon on the Mount, back in chapter 5. Many people think they are not that bad because they have never murdered anyone. But Jesus says, have you ever felt anger and contempt towards anyone? Have you ever done that? Well, then you have already broken God's law. In other words, to use the language from chapter 15, that anger and contempt defiles you or makes you unclean before God. The problem doesn't start when we murder someone. It already starts with the anger and contempt we feel in our heart. So God sees not only our actions, but our hearts as well. Now, I found a few good examples in the discussion among Christian leaders and pastors on the Pastor's Heart program last week. The Sydney Anglican minister, Reverend Phil Colgan, said one of the major issues Christians have been struggling with is not whether to have a vaccine or not, but how to treat people who disagree with you. That is, speaking with grace, love, respect, and gentleness about people who disagree or are hesitant about vaccines. Not using pejorative language like anti-vaxxer and instead talking about people being hesitant. And not using labels such as stupid or nasty on social media to refer generally to protesters. Now, some may be, but others are driven by fear and we need to show grace and respect even with people we disagree with. I think the examples Phil Colgan mentions are related to what Jesus is talking about here in Matthew 15. Using pejorative language or calling people stupid or nasty and so forth is to fail to speak with grace and love and respect about people who disagree with us. Does that not count as slander? Slander is on this list in the right column. Those examples are the kind of thoughts and actions that defile us, that make us unclean before God, according to Jesus. It's always easier to be so concerned with the things on the left column with the human traditions and the rules, such as with hand washing, social distancing, wearing face masks, it's always easier to focus on obeying those rules than to make sure we don't have evil thoughts and treat people with grace and respect. How many times we have heard news of people getting into fights in public places because someone was not wearing face masks and so forth. I heard from a doctor who is a Christian friend that he often meets people who are not vaccinated in his practice. He said, these people are generally increasingly anxious, becoming more isolated from community and often have underlying mental health conditions. They are also the sort of people Jesus went out of his way to minister to personally. It's always easier to be so concerned with vaccination than to ensure we don't have evil thoughts towards those who hesitate or don't want to be vaccinated and treat them with grace and respect. Now, Jesus teaches that 
People are defiled by what comes out of their mouth and heart, rather than by what goes into it. We are made unclean by what is in the right column, than by what is in the left column. But people tend to lose sight of that, because their heart is far from God, as Jesus said earlier in this passage. Please notice how Jesus responds to his disciples here, particularly to Peter, the one who asked Jesus to explain. In verse 15, Peter said, Explain the parable to us. Are you still so dull? Jesus asked them. Don't you see that whatever enters the mouth goes into the stomach and then out of the body? And so on. In other English translations, Jesus says, Are you still without understanding? Jesus seems to expect them to have understood this by now. But they didn't. In a sense, their understanding was not much better than that of the Pharisees, the opponents of Jesus. In other words, they are still implicated in the same problem that those religious leaders face. What Jesus has to teach us in this passage goes beyond all of the science, the medical advice, the politics, the rules, and exposes the real problem, which is the problem with our heart. The problem was there in the days of prophet Isaiah, whom Jesus quoted earlier in this passage. The same problem was there among the leadership of God's people at the time. And even Jesus' own disciples were infected by the same problem. The good news is that we know that the story doesn't stop there. Jesus came to save us from this problem. He died for our sins on the cross. And by that, he put an end to this ritual category of uncleanness or defilement. George Athos, an expert in the Old Testament at Moore Theological College, said that in the Old Testament, whenever anyone in Israel sinned and became unclean, they had to undergo the protocols of offering animal sacrifices to pay for their ritual debt and become clean again. But Jesus' death on the cross was a sacrifice of atonement sufficient to cover the sins of the whole world. Every uncleanness was covered once and for all. Jesus' death did not impart holiness to all people. It only happens through the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit unites people to Christ and is able to save a person and make them holy. But as a result of Jesus' once-for-all sacrifice, there is now no one in the world who can ever be considered unclean. So cosmic was Jesus' death that its cleansing extends to all of creation. Uncleanness has been eradicated in and through Jesus Christ. No sin can disqualify anyone from seeking fellowship with God and members of God's people. All they need to do is repent of their sins, ask for forgiveness, and put their trust in Jesus Christ. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord in the name of Christ. Amen. <laughs>